Some people know oil goes right here under the 710 cap. Almost as many know they should change it occasionally. But to most, where it flows is a mystery. There's two sides to every pump. A high pressure side and a low pressure side. Low pressure in, high pressure out. On a factory DSM oil pump, the low pressure side gets its supply from the oil pan through the oil strainer. So it receives unfiltered oil. Any particles in the oil big enough to fit through the oil strainer screen end up in your oil pump gears. This screen is all the filter it gets. This is the primary reason people replace oil pump gears on engines with high miles. It's because as the gears wear, their oil clearances grow wider and more pressure bleeds back from the high pressure side to the low side through those gaps. Any excess oil pressure that bleeds between the pump gears and the housing while it's being pressurized gets returned to the low pressure side through a small series of galleries cast into both the front and the rear oil pump housing. This is supposed to prevent high oil pressure from building up on the sides of the gears and forcing the gears out of their operating alignment. It reduces friction. The oil pump is good if it can provide enough oil volume to the regulator to satisfy the flow required on the components it's lubricating. So the oil pump's primary job is to provide oil volume, not pressure. Remember this. All of the oil that's pressurized leaves the front case through this oil gallery and travels along a series of large grooves in the front face of the engine block. One seemingly goes nowhere, and that's the unregulated high pressure side from the pump. It passes back through the front case and out the oil filter housing, where it's filtered, regulated, metered for pressure by the sensors, and then returned through this inlet that flows along the block to the main oil gallery. This is the portion of the block where all lubrication begins. The oil hasn't divided or stopped anywhere along the way to lubricate anything else yet. On a 2G block, there are eight oil holes drilled directly off of this gallery to supply the mains, the balance shafts, and the head. On a 1G block, there are four more holes because the oil squirters are tapped directly off the main gallery. Barring that difference, there are five oil supplies, one for each main, two for the balance shaft bearings, and one at the end of the gallery for the head. Every oiled component bolted to the engine eventually gets its oil from those holes. Many of the engine's oiled components are themselves actually oil galleries. You'll remember this in the previous video about the crankshaft. It scavenges oil from the mains and delivers it to the connecting rod's big end bearings. The number one main journal delivers oil to the number one rod journal. The number two main journal delivers oil to the number two rod journal. The number four main journal delivers oil to the number three rod journal and the number five main journal delivers oil to the number four rod journal. The number five journal is a little different and we'll talk about it in a second. The rear balance shaft also does something similar, but the path it takes to get there may come as a surprise to some people. You'll see on the main bearings that there are two oil holes in their faces and a groove to deliver oil to the crankshaft. There's also a groove below the bearing to deliver oil to the secondary oil holes on each bearing's face. There's one oil supply for each of the five mains. On a 2G, the oil squirters that aim at the wrist pins for the pistons comes from this groove after the main bearing is supplied. That's the squirter pressed through and fitted right there. One bearing doesn't have a groove to supply the second oil hole. Naturally, it requires less oil flow as a result. That's the number five main on the flywheel end of the crankshaft. This is where you want as much support as you can get around the crankshaft because a lot happens on this side of the engine. Mitsubishi didn't feel the need for it. Eliminating the groove as well as the oil squirter left more material on the saddle, making this main stronger than the rest. But notice the number one main. It's got a second oil hole just beneath the bearing across from the oil supply. That hole is cross-drilled and intersecting with this hole on the front of the block. That's an oil return hole supplied by the number one main bearing. It's the only bearing that's like this, and the oil that doesn't feed the crankshaft is returned through intersecting bores on the third and smallest groove of the front case. From this short gallery on the front case, oil passes through intersecting holes that eventually meet up on the pump's rear housing. There's an oil gallery drilled all the way through it and staked with a plug on one end. This supplies the oil pump driven gear's shaft bearing surface with oil. The balance shaft, you'll notice, has this groove on it with a cross-drilled hole through it, and this is where the balance shaft receives the oil supply for the solid bearing that's inside the block. In other words, a bearing with no oil holes on it. The bolt on the end of the shaft serves as a plug because this is where they drilled from to create that hollow gallery. The front shaft isn't like this because its oil supplies are tapped directly onto the block's main oil gallery. But on the back of the block, the oil pump shaft is hollow. 
it's third in line for an oil supply. Fourth in line is the oil pump drive gear that runs off the timing belt. The driven gear's bearing surface has another hole on the bottom of the balance shaft groove that leads to the drive gear. The oil pump drive gear is last in line to receive fresh oil. Whatever oil is left over at this point bleeds off into the pan through this little return hole. So this front casing sandwiches a complex routing of fluids between it and the block. Both the block and the front case have to match up in order for your oil system to work properly. It has to be torqued down properly to maintain oil pressures and flow without leaking. It's a precision cut slab of Swiss cheese. Why was all of this important? It's because all of the DIY guys tend to make changes to things inside their engine with a different set of goals than the next one. Many of these modifications affect the oil system and it's important to note which ones need how much oil and when they get it. If any one component is set up looser than the rest and therefore uses or leaks more oil, the oil has to come from somewhere to supply it. Conversely, if there's a part set up too tight or eliminated and blocked off, the pressure it creates inside the oil system needs to go somewhere or else it will affect all of the parts behind it. If it provides oil to a part downstream, it makes things even worse because that restriction deprives those parts of the oil volume they need to work properly, in addition to raising the oil pressure on everything else. This happened to me with my oil pump because of my stub shaft selection. I've got a set of diagrams I made here representing the different models of 4G63s and where the oil flows. I left out the 1G7 bolt and you'll just have to deal with it. Everything for a 1G7 bolt is exactly the same as this 6 bolt oil system chart right here. This shows the oil path through the engine which runs as a cycle. Let's start at 6 o'clock as if we're firing up a cold engine and follow the arrows. This is the order of things from the time the oil leaves the pan. The gray rectangle is the front case. The tan rectangle represents the oil filter housing that sandwiches the front case to the block. The oil galleries that travel all throughout the block are on the left hand side. You'll notice the gray area extends to the components that have oil returned back from the block. I tried to keep it simple. The 12 fat arrows protruding from the fat main gallery line on the left are the primary oil galleries tapped into the main gallery in the order of flow. Secondary galleries branch off of half of these oiled components in order to supply other parts downstream. If a vertical line forks on the chart, it forks at that part to supply other components. Every line leading back to the pan represents oil draining from that component. This is the 6 bolt turbo stock oil system. If you delete the balance shafts and replace the wet shaft with the stub shaft, note the changes to the mains. Two oil holes on the main oil gallery are now blocked off. Also, the rear bearing journal goes away, so you lose three oil supplies and three points where you could leak oil back to the pan. Blocking off these holes creates a restriction, and that's all you need to remember for now. Here's a non-turbo 6-bolt block with no balance shafts, or a turbo no BS block that's had its oil squirters blocked off. Now we're missing six taps off the main oil gallery, seven total oil supplies and returns from the oil system, and as a result, only have enough oil clearances left over to drain half as much of your oil volume back into the pan. I want to talk about my GSX's oil failure again, but from a different perspective of flow rather than fit. First, this is how the 7 bolt flows. Note the main gallery. There's only eight taps off the main gallery, unlike the 6 bolt's 12. That's because Mitsubishi moved the oil squirters to the main bearings oil supply in a 1995 and up production. They also tapped the Garrett T25 off of the high pressure feed at the oil filter housings output instead of at the cylinder head's main oil gallery. That's it. That's all there is, folks. If you followed this video so far, you know how a 4G63 oil system flows. So here's a 7 bolt with deleted balance shafts. It shows the exact same effect on the oiling system. It's missing three oil supplies and there are three oil clearances no longer leaking. When I installed my defective stub shaft, it essentially blocked off both oil pump shafts. This increased pressure on the number one oil squirter and rod bearing. I lost an additional two oil drains. Really, the stub shaft drain line should be the dotted red line as well. So I basically had four galleries blocked off. You could both see and feel the effects of oil starvation on the shaft and bearing surfaces of everything downstream for that stub shaft. The number one main bearing was fine. Based on these charts, now you see why. We'll talk about what happened to my rod bearings later, because the variables that killed those will have little to do with oil flow. I just wanted to give you an example to go along with this topic. The oil filter housings deserve their own video, and I'm going to give it to them.
The pressure discussion would be incomplete, and some of my upcoming modifications could even be confusing without this background information, so I felt it was necessary to share it. If you learned something, or you think this video can help others, then click that like button. It doesn't even put a penny in my pocket, but it helps the channel grow.